Hey everyone, so some exciting things are coming to Behind the Curtain. Exclusive interviews, further commentary on screenwriting, a private community of screenwriters, and more. Today's video is just a preview of what's to come. If you want to be the first one to know when all of this drops, join the email newsletter through the link in the description. As for now, enjoy the video. Hey, welcome to the Behind the Curtain podcast where real screenwriters talk about their process. I'm Nehemiah Jordan and today I'm joined by director Lorcan Finnegan. Lorcan directed the new film Vivarium starring Jesse Eisenberg and Imogen Poots. Vivarium is currently available on digital and on demand. Today we're talking about creating the story with screenwriter Garrett Shanley and what exactly he was trying to say. I guess begin begin talking about kind of what what were some of the beginning ideas? You know, ideas come from all over. What were some of the building blocks that kind of culminated to this main idea of what Vivarium is about? Um, yeah, it's always difficult to kind of pinpoint where these things come from, but um, I mean, I think it was very mostly was the reaction to what was going on socio-politically, the kind of what what. Garrett and I were perceiving as this sort of outside pressure on young people uh, from society. So, um, and and we both kind of had this, uh, you know, both had made things creatively um, separately before we even met that were kind of talking about the same thing. Um, so, like in like two thousand and four. 2004, maybe five. Mm. And I made a short film called Changes, which is about like a two caterpillars who, you know, fall in love and then they turn into butterflies. Uh, and the girl doesn't like the guy anymore mm. because he changed, and you know she changed. <laughs> Things are different now, and you know that. Uh, and then I made a short film in 2007, which is um, probably much more on the nose kind of reaction to. Um, I suppose all my friends who, had kind of, you know, well, well, I guess they must have finished, yeah, they would have been out of college and had good jobs working in banks and things like that. Um, and where, by, you know, their, their, the advice was sort of get on the property ladder and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I made a short film about a guy trapped in a poster, uh, a bank poster that said, like, get a life, get a mortgage on it. And he was trying to, escape from that poster and join this girl who was uh, she was like stencil street art on the other side of the street and they were trying to like meet in the middle somewhere mm-hmm. um, and that was called Defaced and around, I think that same year actually that's when I met Carrot and he'd um, subsequently wrote this short story called Foxes which was um, it's weird because it was kind of it came full circle that, um, you know, Defaced was kind of right at the point where it was really being shoved down people's throats to um, to get on, you know, to get on the property ladder and all this kind of stuff and, and, and buy, buy, buy. Um, and then, in, in, so then in 2008, there was a complete collapse where um, these, housing developments that had been kind of built all over the place. There was like a, a massive abundance of them uh, and banks were giving 100% mortgages and all that kind of stuff. But when everything collapsed, there was this ghost estate phenomenon where there was these um, empty housing developments all over the country. And um, sometimes it'd only be like, you know, one or two people living in a place with like 100 houses. And nature, you know, started reclaiming the place very quickly with trees growing up through the roads. And some places there was nobody living at all. There was these massive housing developments with nobody there. Um, and they'd just be sealed off, and, you know, behind hoarding. And they were kind of like um, graveyards or something. The houses sort of took on these this sort of uh, um, mausoleum quality. Hmm. But, um, yeah, Garrett wrote a short short story on his blog um, which he ran at the time called folktheworld.blogspot.com and he um, yeah he so it was like a short story in first person kind of perspective about uh, a woman and a man living in, in this 
ghost estate and kind of nature reclaiming the place. So that uh, I read that and, and um, thought it would be make a really good short film. So that was our first kind of collaboration together that that resulted in something. We made it. We did actually work on a, another film together that um, was like a sci-fi comedy that. Um, it was going. To, it was way too expensive for what we were trying. What we were trying to do at the time, so we reverted back to making a, a short, and um, that kind of touched on the themes around the atomization of society and um, on the loss of um, of community and um, of the homogenization of these kind of living environments that were. You know, people were like chopping down big forests and areas of important biodiversity to kind of make way for um, these very generic looking housing developments that were cut off from community. Um, and they were just on the, com- you know, commuter, commuter towns, essentially. So there were ideas and themes that we kind of were touching on while making foxes and even while I was scouting and like talking to people and seeing all these places for real and photographing them and everything. Um, but kind of we were, you know, we wanted to explore in a much more sort of universal sense. Um, but even, uh, and that's, that's basically how, how Vivarium got going. Um, it was sort of like the question of like, what if one of these places went on forever? <laughs> you just got trapped in it. Um, I think Garrett, when he was younger, had like a weird experience on acid walking around a house in development where he uh, couldn't find his way out because there was a little thing. But, um, but the film took so long to finance um, because it is, it's like a Euro Copro project with Denmark, Belgium, Ireland, the US. Mm. Um, and some other kind of finance finance bodies around Europe, like your image and stuff, um, that we made another film while we were waiting. So Vivarium was supposed to be my first feature, but I made a film called Without Name, which also kind of deals with, you know, man's uh, obsession with owning um, property and mm. nature. And um, it's about like a, a land surveyor sent down to measure an area of forest that's never been measured or owned by anybody for a developer. And the forest has a kind of entity that protects itself from um, from being measured. Um, so it's, it's quite a psychedelic kind of fairy story hmm. inspired by Irish folklore. But um, I mean, we're we're still talking about the same kind of ideas in a weird way. Um, but where foxes and without name were concerned with with man and the natural world, and uh, Vivarium kind of has a complete like yonder has a complete absence of nature, um, and is very you know it's it's that kind of homogeneity dialed up to the max to sort of show the absurdity and horror of um, of places like these. Very interesting. It's 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 interesting to see the progression of kind of this, these similar themes and sim- similar elements kind of go through these different projects you've had. But I suppose they're all coming from a similar place, um, and that's probably primarily our you know people's relationship with uh, nature and also just um, the kind of behavior of humans, strange behavior of humans. <laughs> Like an anthropological study, um, in some ways. So, in this process of developing the story, say for Vivarium specifically, um, you're working with Garrett. Garrett is, as my understanding, he's the actual screenwriter. He's putting the words on the page. But when you start, when you start with the story, yeah. you know, in this shared vision that you guys have, what were what kind of the stages as you're going through and at the beginning of this idea, this kind of shaping of who the characters are? what's happening, what is the collaboration like there? Yeah, I think we started more with the environment, um, a place, a strange kind of place and tone, um, rather than the characters, uh, with Vivarium anyway, that it was kind of, and I suppose with that name as well, because it's a place gone on him, but, you know, um, it is a kind of character in a way. Um, and, 
So I think with Bavarium, we basically had the kind of world of it and um, various drafts were kind of dropping in different people to see how they react in that environment. And so we started out like, yeah, I think we, we did some stupid stuff like putting in quite extreme characters or, or you know, um, like Tom, who's like a, a property developer himself or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but... You know, we realized after, I guess, you kind of have to go through this process of doing many iterations and, um, and thinking about it, that it's it's much more of a kind of simple universal story where it's more interesting if the people who go in are just very normal. They have to kind of represent the, the everyday person, you know, and that can easily fall into this kind of trap. So... Um, I mean, I think with Vivarium, what we did was worked on the first act a lot. So Garrett would do a draft of first act, and then um, Brunella Coquilia, who's a um, producer, who's produced Foxes, and um, she's an exec on Vivarium, and she produced the name. name. Um, the three of us would then talk about um, it, you know, and on a creative level, and... Um, and figure out things, and then I normally start sending Garrett images as well, or you know, like photos and uh, grabs from movies, or, uh, paintings um, that I've seen, and I guess it all sort of ends up filtering down. Like I sent him a documentary about the, like a BBC documentary about um, the life cycle of the European cuckoo, um, and that helped inform. Um, Martin, like creating this kind of new monster for our time. Um, so we were trying to basically tap into the anxieties um, that young, you know, young people have. But so there's sort of back and forth with that. So that, like some of the, like he, he wrote in the script that the place looks like uh, Magritte's painting Empire of Light. So then I'd try and find ways of doing that physically on set and then be looking at like films by Roy Anderson and stuff like that. But, um, you know, he, he built sets and, and locked them in this kind of strange way and the photography of Gregory Crudson. And, um, and then we'd also be watching a lot of the same films. We'd be watching things like um, Antonioni's Red Desert or um, Teshi Gara's uh, Woman in the Dunes for, you know, not not that it's going to end up looking like that, but just for kind of uh, philosophical kind of uh, conversations. So we end up talking a lot, like Skype and stuff that go on for hours and hours and hours. And we go off on tangents. And, that, and often they end up reading new films. So we normally have like two or three things kind of... Um, you know, stoking various fires, but they all sort of feed into each other. Maybe that's where there's a common theme as well. Now, as, you know, a developing, like, filmmaker, this is your second feature, what was a big thing that you learned um, through making Vivarium? <laughs> um, yeah, like, production on Vivarium was a bit of a nightmare um, because we... T- it, it because of the, the structure of the financing and how we had to how we had to put it together and where we had to shoot and spending little bits of money in various countries and um, and also working being you know working on, on on a set where everything has to be built and made um, and also being very reliant on VFX to extend scenes um, and all of that kind of thing. I mean, on without name, we were able to. We we're on the shooting location, like gorgeous locations where you could just turn the camera around, find a shot, um, and it was much more freeing. Um, on Vivarium, it was much more restrictive, and it took a lot more planning. Um, and then the post process was like far longer with um, sort of micromanaging all these VFX artists around the place to make sure that the aesthetic was <clears throat> was. Um, consistent throughout because there's different countries working on different shots and um, and, then, and also just the, the, yeah, having an international team and getting everyone on board with the same kind of vision was um, it was tricky but you know it was it was a very steep learning curve it was like being dropped behind enemy lines 
and been given like five weeks to make a movie. Um, when all we had was the facade of three houses on a set. So like we didn't have a, a big set of the exterior for Yonders, but to make those three facades act for everything, so all the reverse angles had to be faked and flipped. And um, so it was, uh, and like all the planning we had, we were supposed to shoot seven weeks and that became five and a half. So I storyboarded everything so to kind of reimagine things very quickly on my feet um, while shooting. So um, I guess it was like, uh, it was, it was, it was a painful experience, but one where I've come out uh, knowing a lot more about how I like to work and who I like to work with and um, and how I would set up um, the next projects moving forward. And that's what that's what we're doing right now, um, working on a on a new film that um, has a different kind of structure, not a million miles away from. Uh, variant, but one that's going to work better for for the creative process and for production. That's good to hear. Thank you so much for talking to me today. No worries, man. Pleasure. If you want to watch Vivarium, it's available today on digital and on demand. If you want to hear more exclusive behind the curtain interviews and more, sign up for the email newsletter on behindthecurtainfilm.com or through the link in the description. I'll see you guys next time.